All right. Welcome, everyone, to Value Investing Live. I am pleased to welcome our guest this week, Charles Lemonidis, the founder of ValueWorks. Charles founded ValueWorks with the goal of broadcast, or broadening availability of his conceptual value investing discipline in the retail and institutional investor communities. He serves as chief investment officer and leads investment research and portfolio management. As always, for those of you out in the audience, do please feel free to post your questions and comments in the live chat section throughout the presentation today, but do keep in mind we will be holding those until the Q&A at the end. Without anything further from me, I'll go ahead and hand things over to Charles and we can jump into the presentation. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for being on this call with us today or this uh, web broadcast as it were. Uh, ValueWorks is exactly that, a little investment advisory shop trying to apply a value craft uh, in the U.S. equity space, sometimes uh, going into the fixed income space when distressed debt offers us an opportunity. To us, value investing is not about buying dead businesses cheap, but buying quality assets at compelling prices. Value is one of the two or three major investment schools of thought. Um, and it's more than a metric specific approach. It's a conceptual approach of saying, look, what are the assets behind this investment? What are those assets worth in the real world today? And what price am I paying to control those assets when I buy this stock or this bond? We look for places where we're getting a dollar's worth of assets for 50 cents, where we're doing it for it with assets that are hopefully appreciating in value and where we have some reason to believe the discount between uh, the price that they're trading for today and the underlying value is going to close over time. We've been doing that for about 25 years in the long only space with portfolios of 25, 30 long only names. And we've do been doing it for about 20 years in um, a long short portfolio construct where we are typically putting to work a dollar 25 for every dollar of equity invested with us. And here we go. Um, putting to buying a dollar, putting to work a dollar twenty-five, and shorting about twenty-five cents. So we tend to have one times market exposure in our long biased portfolio architecture. The nice thing about how we've performed over the years is that oh, let's see if we can get a slide going on here. Sorry. All right. So. The nice thing about how we performed over those 20 years is that we have volatility, but we have major upside market capture. And so we end up generating very, very solid long-term rates of return. It's a portfolio structure and architecture and approach that works if you have a, the discipline to stay invested through tumultuous periods. It doesn't work if you say you're a long-term investor, but when things go down, um, you pull the plug. We've earned about 12 and a half percent over the life of our portfolio of 20 plus years when the S&P has done about 7%. Over the past 10 years, we've only topped the S&P by a half a percent, earning 14.3 per year net to investors versus 13.8 on the S&P. That's a small premium to the S&P and sort of not necessarily exciting. But on the flip side, over 10 years, we've earned investors 14.5% per year. And over the scope of our portfolio, you know, a dollar invested with us has become three times what you would have made in the S&P over the full 20 year span. We've done that with having not just one or two big upside years, but with having a whole bunch of 30, 40, 50, 60% years, and then combining those with a couple of periods of very sharp contraction. And let me just give a second uh, pause to talk about where I think we are today in the scheme of things in terms of market volatility and, and upside. A year ago, we saw a very significant collapse in equity prices. We at ValueWorks saw that as an opportunity to put money to work. So we went out there with our toolkit of appraising assets and liabilities and found 25, 30 things to put in the portfolio on the long side and a handful of things on the short side um, that we thought were just incredibly compellingly priced a year ago as the markets melted down. And, you know, as has typically happened for us, you know, we got in early, you know, we bought falling knives and took our hits on the way down, which is something if you look at that chart of our performance, you know, 
we've done before. Um, you know, we when we're getting a dollar's worth of assets for 50 cents, we like it. When we're getting them for 30 cents, we like it more. Um, and we're not afraid of committing capital at those moments of massive volatility. In the past, when we've gone through those periods, we've tended to make people back their, their, their money in six to nine months. So you see sharp contractions in the past, but you've seen us earn them back in six to nine months. And then in the two or three or four years after that, we've tended to earn people solid rates of return. So, you know, the, the history of our performance has been that when turmoil strikes, you know, we go into it with diversified portfolios that make sense in terms of pricing. Markets go to massively dislocated places. We commit further capital and we go up the capital structure and we're real aggressive in those periods. Um, six months later, nine months later, we've tended to make our money back. And then in the two and four years after that, we double, double the portfolio value. So that's how we've earned, you know, 12 percent a year over seven and a half percent on the S&P over 20 years. Uh, it's not for the it's not for those who are going to get shaken out at the bottom. But if you have the confidence to stay with the approach, it's the way that, I, you know, I, I think you earn your best rates of return over time. Now, I think, you know, we're early innings of the recovery from what happened a year ago. Um, we're probably doing better than we have in most previous market cycles in terms of um, getting back to even and getting ahead um, quickly. You know, obviously our portfolio troughed last year in March or so. Today, our portfolio is solidly 30, 40% above where it was in December of last year. So, you know, we sort of had a peak in December of last year. We came down. Um, it's at the end of March, we'll pro which is today, you know, it looks like, and I'm not counting the day over yet. Um, we'll be up more than 35%, um, more likely than not, um, from where we were December 31 last year. And I think that's just the beginning. And I think it's just the beginning because of the market and economic setup that we have in front of us. Um, look, we're value investors, so we care about what price we're paying for securities. And our skill set is really in understanding what businesses and assets are worth in the real world and really understanding what price we're paying to control them. And we could look at the indexes today and think that maybe they're they're overly priced and fully priced and they have risk in the downside to them, but I'm not sure that that's the right lens to look at the world through. Frankly, you know, if you look at the indexes from aggregate number perspectives over the past 12 months or even forward 12 months, there are a couple of things that really distort what you're seeing in the, in the aggregate metrics. One obvious thing is that a huge part of the economy, the energy sector, has contributed a huge zero or big negative number to the absolute earnings number in the PE. And, you know, look, a year ago, oil prices were headed to negative territory. We haven't seen that before. Um, you know, those businesses are worth money and will be worth money next year and the year after, whether it's a company that owns oil production or it's a company that owns drilling rigs or it's a pipeline that moves the stuff around. But those companies in aggregate are adding zero to the E in PE right now when you look on a trailing basis and they're adding very little when you look on a forward basis and that skews the numbers. The other place where the numbers are skewed when people talk about where the indexes are relative to historic valuations is that the big money in the indexes today is in companies that are completely global. Google, Amazon, Netflix, um, you know, the big tech names across the board, Qualcomm, Intel. Look, these big tech names that are U.S. domiciled, headquartered businesses that are big parts of the S&P 500 and big parts of the Dow, you know, you, you can say that the S&P is at a very high multiple to historic, you know, the, the market cap of the S&P relative to U.S. GDP is pushing peak levels. But U.S. GDP isn't the relevant metric when you're looking at Google or Facebook or Amazon or any of these big tech companies, because these are global businesses absolutely and, and completely, and they're global winners. You know, there there is no um, compare for Amazon on a global basis. There's, it's really hard to knock Google on a global basis. 
up and down the spectrum of these big heavily weighted tech stocks, they're global winners. And so when you compare their valuation to US GDP, it's apples to, to oranges. It just doesn't make any sense. So I'm digressing a little bit into where I see the markets and where I see the economy. And I think it's a really important discussion for us to have right now because it's a tricky moment for investors. Um, it's a really, really tricky moment for investors. Uh, there's just so, there are so many cross currents and so many confusing signals and so much concern about where we are. And it's all legit um, concern. And it's really the incredibly important for folks deciding what to do with their assets over the next five, 10 years to have a sense of what's happening, big picture. And um, yeah, I think from my perspective, the best way to get a sense of what could be happening is to look at the nuts and bolts and the real tight specifics, and also to take seven steps back and look at a really, really broad brush and, and a big picture perspective. And there's a degree to which you get caught in the weeds a little bit too much if you look at the details in between. So what I mean by that specifically is, you know, from, from a seven steps back perspective and a long perspective, market cycles tend to be long. Yeah, it's, it, it's pretty normal for a cycle to last 20 years. And market cycles tend to go from really, really deep despair to really, really powerful exuberance. And I think we're halfway between those two places. Look, I, I was investing money in 1999, 2000, and it was exuberance. It was heady times and it was prosperous times. And it was um, a moment when everyone was generating huge amounts of wealth. I lived through 2007, 2009, and it was a dark, deep despair. I look around today, and this is not 2008, 2009. You know, what we've gone through over the past 12 months is not anything like the financial crisis of that 2008, 2009 period, but it's also really nowhere close, nowhere close to the 98, 2000 toppiness. And that makes some sense because previous market cycles have taken a lot more than 10 years to play out. Um, when I came into this business in the early mid 1980s, people talked about the headiness of the late 1960s and then the bear market of 1974. And they talked about it all the time. And I was 22 years old and I thought these people were troglodytes and dinosaurs for talking about stuff that happened so darn long ago. Um, and I, there was a lot of truth to my perspective. And there's a lot of truth to that perspective now when people talk about uh, 2007, 2009 is, hey, maybe being right around the corner. It ain't. Um, the market cycle that peaked in 1968 started in 1945 at the end of World War II. That was a 20 year run from shitty economic times, and that's a sophisticated financial term, um, to real excitement in the late 1960s. And then you went from the late 1960s to 1981, um, a downside. And then the move up took you from the trough in 78 to the peak in 1999. It was a 20 year move from trough to peak. We're 10 years into a move from a trough 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And the peak could easily be five, seven, 10 years in front of us. That's sort of a really important perspective because of a couple of things. First of all, um, a lot of investors are out there waiting for the other shoe to drop, um, waiting for a good entry point into the markets. And that's a wall of fear that the market climbs over an extended period of time. And it takes um, a grueling toll, a grueling toll on those that are sitting there waiting for their entry point, sitting in cash saying, look, I don't believe the hype. The other tough part about the second half of a market advance is something that, you know, you can understand conceptually, but you have to try to understand it conceptually, because if you look at it from a statistical perspective, you don't get there. And that is that 
it is heady, exciting, growth, speculative, fervent stocks that bring you to a market top. It is not staid, boring companies. It is not value stocks that bring you to a market top. You know, in heady times when the shoeshine boy is giving you stock market tips, it's not to buy uh, a boring uh, industry, a boring big cap um, old school company. The stuff that moves into the market top is the stuff that is super exciting and gets super, super extended. Now, what do you do about that? You know, if you're a prudent investor and saying, look, I don't want to buy stocks that are at exuberant valuations just because they're going up every day, you know, I'm not, you know, then, you know, what do you do? Um, stand on the sidelines? Well, that's not a good strategy. Get in and hope to get out before the music stops. It's, a, it's an approach, but it's a dicey one. Or, you know, what we work on doing is trying to find things that might become exciting and exuberant in the future, but that aren't perceived that way today. And that is a particular um, work process and skill set that's involved to identify things that could one day be perceived as dynamic growth stocks that get a lot of investor enthusiasm and attention, but that aren't getting it today. And so when we build our portfolio at ValueWorks at 25, 30 names, we go out looking for stocks that we believe at some point in the future, investors could think are incredible growth stories and that will get attention and enthusiasm from people looking for things that are exciting. Because frankly, I think we're going to an exciting place five to seven years from now. And if you're just in quote unquote value stocks that are you know, mediocre quality businesses trading at cheap prices, you're gonna be on the side of the road when those in the, in, in the, um, in the exciting names are, are earning you know, 30, 50 and 100% on their, on their capital year in a year out over a five year period. And I think that that's a hard process, but I think it's a really important process. And I think that what we see from a big picture perspective is that we're likely to get to that exuberant place. Now, you know, having lived through the 1980 to 2000 bull market, you know, I do recall pretty clearly that it was interrupted by a market crash in 1987 that was darn vibrant. Um, and then another three year period of really challenging economic times as the US went through a recession in the 1990 91 timeframe. And, you know, we had a president that lost an election at that point, because the other guy said it's the economy stupid. Um, and the economy in 1991 was not awesome. So we went through a three year period in the middle of that very large extended advance where equity investors had to really work to earn a living and earn a rate of return. So there was a choppiness smack dab in the middle of that. And there's no doubt, but that in the past year, there has been a massive choppiness in the markets. Now, if all we're doing is using history as a guide and looking back um, at that three-year interruption of growth in the middle of a 20-year cycle, and we ask ourselves if we're going to get another two-year interruption here, there are plenty of arguments that you will. Um, you know, there are plenty of ways we could up, upend this economic advance over the next couple of years. On the other hand, history doesn't always repeat, even though it may rhyme. Um, so it's not, it's not, I think, a foregone conclusion that we'll get an economic slowdown right here. And so, you know, you have to be positioned in my mind for either eventuality. And I think the way you do that is careful individual security selection. And that's what we really bring to the table at ValueWorks. Let's see if I can get to our next slide. So, you know, a value investor tries to identify the underlying assets, understand what they're worth in the real world, those assets could be cash money on the balance sheet. They could be natural resource reserves. They could be um, equipment that you own that has a value. Um, and really understand the price you're paying to get at them. 
a lot of investors will talk about the importance of a healthy balance sheet. Um, I don't really care about a healthy balance sheet if I am at the right place in the capital structure. So one thing we do at ValueWorks that's, that's particular is that we start our equation asking what the assets are, what they're worth. And then we move on to what are the claims against those assets? And if there is a, a pool of assets that we think is worth 10-ish billion dollars, which, you know, for argument's sake, let's talk about Valaris right now. Valaris is one of the largest owners of offshore drilling equipment in the world. They've inve they have invested about $20 billion to build a fleet of vessels that are everything from the highest spec jackups to the highest spec drill ships. About a year ago, they had about $10 billion worth of debt on their balance sheet and had invested $20 billion in, in the assets under, underlying that debt. The debt came down to as low as five and 10 cents on the dollar. We entered that investment through the debt, paying between five and 10 cents. When you're buying $10 billion worth of debt at five cents on the dollar, you're paying $500 million to control those assets. It matters where you are in the capital structure. It matters which debt instrument you are. It matters how much bank debt there is. It matters how much secured debt there is. It matters which subsidiary you own. So there's a lot of nuance to it. Um, but you know, that's all stuff you can learn and figure out if you, if you do that work. <clears throat> in the case of Valaris, um, we were, we understood which instruments were where in the capital structure. And we were basically buying the underlying assets at 500 to a billion dollars. When we think the assets are probably going to be worth in today's world in the four to $6 billion range, which is a massive discount to the $20 billion that this company paid to build those assets over the past 20 years. Valaris is coming out of bankruptcy in the next couple of days. Um, their plan may be going live today. It was confirmed by the bankruptcy court about a month and a half ago. All the paperwork has been done. The debt is going to be converted into common stock. And the debt holders were given an option to buy new common shares to give the company a little bit of extra cash on the balance sheet. That common stock starts trading this week. We're pretty sure the valuation will be something like two and a half billion dollars as it starts trading. We'll probably see something like two, three times upside relative to our investment over the past couple of years as that common stock comes out. But at that point, we'll be owning a, a pool of assets at, you know, basically 12 cents on the dollar relative to replacement costs. Now, you know, Offshore drilling has a whole ton of problems associated with it. Um, maybe we'll never do any more offshore drilling again. Maybe it's an industry in decline, or maybe we're somewhere in the middle of a cycle for energy um, demand. Um, and maybe, you know, those, those um, assets will end up being in demand a year from now, two years, three years from now. Um, and maybe they'll trade for 50% of replacement cost, which means we'll have 4x upside our investment relative to today's price. So that's what I mean by, you know, identify the assets, understand, get some sense of what they're worth, and then understand what price you're paying to control them through a specific security. And that's how it, how it played out in one specific investment. I don't know if I should talk about portfolio construction at this point. Let's skip that for a second and come back to it. And perhaps it makes more sense to talk a little bit more about where we see um, valuations and where we see opportunity in individual names. And actually, this is a good point to talk about portfolio construction. Um, our long only our, our hedge fund portfolio, our long bias portfolio, looks to own about 25, 30 individual investments and tries to do it in ways that there are a dozen or 15 investments that are really, really different from each other. So we just talked about Valaris. We own a couple of other um, energy related investments. One is Hornbeck Offshore. They own a fleet of offshore drilling I'm sorry, a fleet of offshore supply vessels. 
they went through a bankruptcy. They're private right now. They'll probably be public in a couple of in a within the next year. We also own uh, a position in Pacific Drilling, which also same basic shtick as Valeris. Um, they came out of bankruptcy uh, a month, uh, a couple of months ago, and they just ag- announced an agreement to be bought by one of their larger competitors. The common stock on that competitor has been trading in the gray market and will probably become pretty fully liquid and public as the Pacific Drilling acquisition closes. Those are different investments, but darn it, they're very, very related and they're, they'll tend to go up and down together. But then we also own um, Invesco, which is an asset management company that is trading at something like 10 times forward earnings at this point. Asset management companies have a basic business model where there's a dollar amount of assets under management. In good market environments, those assets appreciated 10, 12%. Invesco has had the challenge of most asset managers that um, organic growth has been brutal over the past eight, 10 years because of where the money has been made in the markets. They also have the challenge that feed compression has been happening um, and it's going to continue happening. So as um, the, um, the ability to grow assets by through compounding has been tough, and as new asset flows have been tough, and as fee compression has been tough, um, revenue growth has stalled, and EPS has not been as robustly growing as it had in a long for a long time. As a result, the PE has come down to you know pushing single digit levels. From this point forward, if we get the kind of excited market environment we're talking about, we'll be seeing 12, 15% rates of return on equities for a long time. And asset growth at this company will probably match that 12, 15% rate and fee compression is probably gonna slow down. So you'll, so you'll, pro- and, and, um, you'll get operating leverage in there. So you'll probably get better than 15% a share, uh, 15% per year EPS growth. Asset managers is to have historically traded at 20 to 30 times earnings. If you get five years worth of earnings growth in that 15% range for Invesco, you're going to see the stock trade at 20 times earnings. If you get 15% per year earnings growth and you're starting at 10 times and you end up with a multiple of 20 times, you know, you're not earning, you know, 50% on your money. You're making three times your money over the next three years. And that's the kind of name that can easily go from completely unloved where it is today to very, very loved at some point in the future. So we have 25, 30 names that are really different in the portfolio. And then we have a half a dozen to a dozen short names that are also very, very security specific and very much the mirror side of our long only exposure. So they're a dollar's worth of assets trading for $3. We think the assets are not appreciating in value over time. And we think there's a reason to believe the premium is gonna close. Some of the big names we're, sh- and we try to avoid um, places where the valuation has come down so hard already and where the metrics are low already. And so that if there's a reversal of fortunes, the upside is dangerous. So for example, um, we're short Broadcom. Broadcom trades at you know, I, I, I think it's 30 plus times earnings. Other analysts think it may be a 22 times earnings. I don't, I think their measure of earnings are bogus um, because of the accounting treatments there and what they're considering core earnings and what they're considering not core earnings and what they're, how they're adjusting EPS. Um, I think the analysts are, are extraordinarily optimistic in how they um, treat earnings at Broadcom. The multiple to sales at Broadcom is extraordinary. Um, it's as high as any of the, well, it's not as high as the NVIDIAs of the world, but it's, it's, uh, it's up there. And the thing about Broadcom that makes them mediocre is that all the growth at Broadcom has happened through acquisitions and then cost cutting. So the business model at Broadcom is buy a business, hollow it out, milk it for cash flow and earnings over a period of time, and then buy a bigger business with an expensive stock price, hollow it out and and keep playing the game until you can't do it anymore. The problem with Broadcom is they've done it until they can't do it anymore. They started out doing it in the chip space where, look, 12 years ago in 2009, you know, people were giving these companies away and they got companies for for free. 
they bought assets, they, they sold the foundry and the, and the manufacturing capacity, subbed it out to Taiwan Semiconductor to manufacture the chips and milked, it, milked the cash flow, which is great so long as the airplane's moving forward through space. The problem is three, four years ago, they ran out of acquisition targets in chip manufacture, in chip in the chip space. So they started buying software companies thinking that's the same thing and maybe it is, but it's not their core skill set. So they've diversified into things they don't know. Um, there are no acquisitions for them to do and the valuations are extraordinary. So if there is a bump in the road, you know, it gets cut in half. And I don't see how there's this sort of GameStop risk to it on the upside. Another one that is really, really similar um, in a different space is Transdime. The symbol is TDG. They're an aerospace um, parts maker. So they make spare parts for every commercial aircraft out there and, and a whole lot of the military aircraft. They also have grown through acquisition where they take over a small little company, um, fire all their staff, fire their salespeople, continue to manufacture the products, um, jack up the prices two, three X over the first three years of acquisition, have great earnings growth, but they're trading also at, you know, five, seven times sales, depending upon which sales you're using. And, and in the aerospace business over the past year, you can imagine there's been some variability in sales and basically 40 times forward earnings. Um, and they also have grown to the point that there are no more acquisition targets for them to, to buy. Um, they haven't done a major acquisition in almost three years. Their earnings growth obviously stalled over the past 12 months and has gone big time negative. And again, it's trading at 40 ish times, you know, best case earnings. And it's, you know, it, it's an equity cap that is, you know, order of, you know, it's, it's order of magnitude 25, 30 billion dollars. You know, when GameStop troughed, it was an order of magnitude of $300 million. The, the upside risk in a $300 million equity cap to 25 billion, you know, is a, obviously almost 10 times your, 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 your capital you lose on that investment as it goes up. Um, it's really hard to see how um, Transdime goes to a $300 billion equity cap when they're doing $6 billion worth of annual sales. And, you know, there, you, you, you'd have to buy three Boeings to justify it getting up there, and they're not buying three Boeings because there aren't three Boeings in the world. So we're super security specific on the short side. We're super security specific on the long side. One of my favorite long investments today, and I'll spend four or six minutes talking about this, um, is uh, United Natural Foods. United Natural Foods, symbol is UNFI, trades around $33 a share, a couple of billion dollar equity cap now, up from four or $500 million equity cap uh, a little while ago. Let's see if I can get to my next slide. All right. So their basic business is um, wholesale food distribution, which, and, and they supply supermarkets. Um, mid-sized, large supermarkets, small independent supermarkets, wherever you buy your groceries, um, online in a, I'm sorry, in a brick and mortar format, um, they sell about $28 billion worth of, of um, groceries uh, to those supermarkets every year. Not every year, but this year, not last year, because um, they've been growing. Hold on one second. They fell out of favor over the past couple of years because they went from being a, perceived as a growth stock to being perceived as a, a dead and dying company. We think they may well be properly perceived as a growth stock again. Um, and let's talk about where they've been in terms of stock price. Well, let's see where they are in terms of, uh, this slide is a, a month old. So back then they had a $28 share price. It was a $1.5 billion equity cap, a couple of billion dollars of debt, $4 billion enterprise value, 26 billion in sales going to 27 and EBITDA of around $800 million a year. And we think the EBITDA is growing. When we talk about it being potentially perceived as a growth stock, let's see if we can, <clears throat> This chart's old. This chart shows the company 
stock performance from 2000 to 2015. It's a pretty easy chart to read. Um, it's up and to the right. Over this period, they had 15% compound annual uh, revenue growth. Um, they typically traded it 20 to 40 times trailing earnings. You know, you have 15% revenue growth, you traded 25 times, 20 times trailing earnings, no surprise. Things went amiss. Oh, that's two slides forward. And this fast brings you from 2015 to 2018. Um, they fell out of favor. They fell out of favor because their growth stopped. A lot of what gave them their growth was that they were the number one supplier to Whole Foods. Whole Foods crushed it from 2000 whatever to 2015. And then Whole Foods had a, a period when their, their results were challenged. Um, UNFI um, participated in the challenge. Um, and more than anything else, you know, its, it's operating results became flattish. And the multiple went from really high to pretty darn low um, by the time 2008, end of 2018 came around. The other thing they did in this period <clears throat> was agree to buy super value, which was by far and away the largest independent publicly traded um, food distributor. Super value was a stock that got kicked from pillar to post for 10 years <clears throat> before they were bought by United Natural Foods. They got knocked from pillar to post because um, their strategies just kept changing and they just couldn't shoot straight. Um, the analyst community was not happy that these guys were buying them. Then these guys, from a financial <clears throat> modeling perspective, messed up the acquisition every which way from Tuesday. <clears throat> their CFO could not shoot straight also. We stepped into the stock right here. You know, basically we paid 20 something dollars a share. Um, all right, I guess our first purchase was 24 and a half on uh, October 22nd, 18. Um, <laughs> that did not work out well for the next couple of months. Uh, that's 20. That's five. In our hedge fund structure, you know, we put four to eight percent to work on day one. We tend to put four to five percent to work on day one. If things get cheaper for us, we'll add to the position. It's an aggressive portfolio. It's designed to take risk. You know, we own that bottom ticket five and a half, um, which felt great and not so great um, owning um, the stock from 24. We started this presentation talking about how we've earned great rates of return over extended periods of time, but it's come with volatility. This stock on the way down, you know, shows you how that volatility happens. Um, at five bucks a share, we just couldn't believe the valuation being presented. And here we are, you know, a short period of time later. I'm not sure that that chart, I, I'm not sure the um, data at the bottom of that chart showing you that that's 2017 is quite right. That, that last data point on the right is of course last week. Um, at the, with the stock at back to 28, it's not two years ago. Um, the, the data on the top saying it's to March 2nd, 2021 is the correct part. Have these guys been a growth company? Look at their revenues. 2013, they did 6 billion. 2016, they jump around a little, eight and a half, nine, 10. Major acquisition, 22, 26. That's real revenue growth. Some of it through acquisition, some of it organic. They've gotten it both ways. Cost of sales, you know, have been fine. You know, their their business is not falling apart. Their operating income, as you see, has grown over those seven years. You know, from 180 to 330 million, and EBITDA has grown, and that's through August of 2020, which sort of has some COVID bump in it in August of 2020, but only three lousy months if. Um, the numbers for this year are going to be closer to, to 750, 800 million of EBITDA and $28 billion worth of sales. Now, that gives them around $4 a share of earnings and the stock trades at 32 bucks. Now, 32 is a lot higher than five, but again, they're earning $4 a share and that's real. Um, and it's not accounting gimmickry or chicanery or anything else. It's just margins and it's cash flow and it's real operating results. 
who cares to buy a dying business at 10 times earnings or nine times earnings? Um, not me, but I don't think it's a dying business. Um, the analyst community thinks this company is a dying company because one, super value was terrible. Two, brick and mortar retail is the way, not the future, kids. Um, you know, people are going online. Uh, people are using e-tailers. People are having their food delivered to their house and they're not going to the stupid supermarket. Um, get with it. That's a trend that's not going to reverse. And by the way, you know, Amazon is a big deal. Um, and maybe Amazon wants to be the wholesaler. Well, a couple of things to consider. Amazon owns Whole, owns Whole Foods. One of the concerns in this stock has been that um, Amazon would stop using uh, UNFI as their distributor of choice at Whole Foods. That concern has been there since Amazon bought Whole Foods five years ago. Um, they tend, have tended to have 10 year contracts, Whole Foods and UNFI, and they've tended to renegotiate them every five years. They just renegotiated their contract and now they have a contract with Whole Foods that goes out seven years from now. If Amazon was firing them, they don't sign a contract that lasts for another seven years. Also, Amazon has no business firing them because it would be stupid. This company does $600 million worth of cash flow and has an equity cap at $2 billion. If Amazon wants this business as their own, they know how to get it. They pay $3 billion for this company. They don't go out and build a fleet worth of trucks and 22 warehouses and 10 years worth of investment to get what these guys have rather than give them $3 billion worth of, of uh, capital to buy it. Um, it makes no sense for them to compete. Also, this is a good business for us to own because we're paying two, $3 billion for $700 million worth of cash flow on a $26 billion revenue base, and we're paying $3 billion. Amazon doesn't want to be in a, margin, a, a business with these sorts of margins. That's not where the excitement is. And the evidence of that is that Amazon is one of their biggest customers outside of Whole Foods. Wait a minute. Amazon is one of their biggest customers outside of Whole Foods because e-tailing, where people go on a website and buy their food and get the stuff to deliver to the door is the future. So why can't UNFI just become an e-tailer? By the way, they have a really, really good front end that they give the supermarket chains that, that are their customers to power um, online purchases. So if you're, you know, a random re a retailer in the middle of America owning 35 stores, and you want to have a click and collect um, internet presence and a way for people to buy your stuff online, and you're a UNFI customer, they'll charge you a small amount for the software to do it. Why doesn't UNFI do it? UNFI doesn't do it because UNFI's business is to back up big tractor trailers to big factories and take tractor trailer full of ketchup or whatever else and bring it to a big, big distribution center and then put it on big, big tractor trailers and bring it to somebody else who's going to get it to someone's door. UNFI doesn't have the infrastructure to send six things of toothpaste or two cans of tuna fish and, and a quart of orange juice to your house. UNFI doesn't have that infrastructure. The guys who do, the online sellers, have the infrastructure to break it down and get it to your door. But guess what? They don't have the infrastructure to back up a 18 wheeler um, and fill up a huge container full of ketchup and then break it down. So all the online retailers, all those e-tailers we're talking about being in the wave of the future are UNFI customers. And UNFI has that, or that business growth because they have all of the e-tailers as customers, not all of them, but it's a big, they have the huge majority of them. Operating results have been super solid. Uh, not super solid, they've had some bumps, but they're pretty good. If we're right two years from now, people are going to be thinking that UNFI is a growth stock. They'll have earnings of something like five bucks a share. 
And we think they'll trade at something like 20 times earnings, and we could easily see them going to 30 times earnings. Um, today, they're at 32. That's up from six. Like I said at the start of this presentation, you know, we take our licks on our investments on the way down because we think we understand them. Um, we did that in, in uh, UNFI. Um, we sort of did it in Valaris. We took a small position when it was an expensive bond. We bought a boatload more when it was super cheap. We think we have a portfolio of 25 of these names on the long side that are going to participate dramatically through whatever market environment the world gives us. And we think that if we get to a place where the markets are super excited, we as value investors have a very good chance of having two to four names in our portfolio go from completely unloved to completely loved. And when the world is a place where cheap is 12 times earnings and expensive is 17 times earnings, when you go from unloved to loved, you make your lousy 50%. When the world is a place where cheap is eight times earnings and expensive is 32 times earnings, when you go from unloved to loved, you make 4x or 5x your money if you also get some earnings growth in there. That place where cheap becomes expensive is a great sweet spot for value works. We won't get every name in our portfolio getting there in a given year. Um, and obviously, some of them will never get there and we'll get some of the names wrong, sorry. Um, but if we get two to four of them going up three times our money each year and the rest of them, you know, give us a 10% rate of return, we'll have really, really compelling, exciting results on the way up. Um, you know, I've spoken for, for a couple of minutes now. Um, so I think it might be time for me to uh, sip a little bit of coffee and uh, see if there's anyone who's got anything to say uh, that they want to hear about specifically. All right. Well, we do have a couple of questions lined up here, Charles. Uh, it looks like three of them initially right off the bat here uh, from LVM Fund out there in the chat. Uh, we can go ahead and dive into here. Uh, hopefully some more will roll in here as we get the ball rolling. If not, we have some on the back burner that we can jump into as well. First question up, though. Uh, asking, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, on the leverage using in your investment process, um, specifically as a percentage of your total portfolio value, if you wouldn't mind? Sure. So we don't think people should use us to get leverage in the financial markets. Um, you know, our client base has cash on the sidelines. They have fixed income investments and they have money with in equities. Um, so, you know, if they want to be torqued up, they just commit more capital. Um, they don't need us to leverage the portfolio. Um, we tend to go for, you know, if we have, right now we're at about a $100 million fund. Um, we have about $130 million long in the portfolio and about $20 million short in the portfolio today. So right now we're about 130, 130% long and 20% short. And yeah, that's a sort of our, our, our target place is to be one X the market. And we're, our target place is to be one X the market because our investors don't need us to give them leverage. We think the markets will go up over time. We want to have the tailwind of market rates of return. If you're going to commit capital to us, we might as well earn you the market rate of return. Um, but there are things that we want to do in the portfolio on the short side that are just make for a better portfolio than not having them. And that's because when we put short names in the portfolio, um, they're designed to take risk off the table in a sense, in that, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll work a little, little bit differently than the market does. Um, and they're designed to be good individual investments that marry well with the rest of the portfolio. So look, I talked about um, Invesco, which we're long in the portfolio. They're a money manager trading at single digit earnings multiples. We're short invest net, which is in a very, very, very analogous business. Um, you know, they provide a platform for separate account management and they charge a couple of, and they charge basis points fees for every dollar of assets on their platforms. That's really not that different than a money manager that charges, you know, basis points for managing money. 
Um, and Vesco is trading at 40 ish times earnings and about five times sales, um, which is, you know, 4x the multiples of Invesco. IVZ. Um, we think those two investments are great together. We think that, you know, one of those things doesn't belong there. Um, and we want to have that short exposure, but we don't necessarily want to give up market rates of return. So we think by being a little extra long and then adding the short exposure, you get more oomph and you get more of our investment expertise in the portfolio. Um, you know, we put that portfolio structure in place because someone asked me 20 years ago, Charles, if what you cared about was earning rates of return over time, how would you build a portfolio for your money? And I scratch my head a little bit and put this portfolio architecture in place. And it's really done exactly that over 20 years. For sure. And continuing on now, uh, same, uh, same viewer here asking, uh, what was the analysis that led to the uh, Whiting Petroleum Corp investment? If that's how you pronounce it, it correctly. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Um, so Whiting Petroleum is a, 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 an ENP company operating up uh, in the Bakken, um, in that northern part of the continent where, you know, we've had all that great discovery of energy resources. Uh, the company, Whiting was built um, independently for a long time. They bought a company called Kodiak for about six, seven billion dollars around five years ago. Um, they have huge natural resource uh, reserves across that part of America. They were built up in part uh, through leverage, but not that much. Um, and that Kodiak acquisition, they put on a lot of debt. When they finished the Kodiak acquisition, the combined enterprise had a value of about $18 billion. They worked for about four years to whittle that debt down, and they got the debt down to about $2.8 billion. And they had a debt instrument coming due for a couple of hundred million dollars this time last year. In fact, today, last year, I think it was, April 1st. <laughs> funny day. Um, sorry, Whiting Petroleum. Um, it wasn't so funny for Whiting Petroleum because um, they had whittled their debt down. They got into the place where they had a lousy $250 million worth of debt coming due. And we were at a moment in time when the, the, the bottom was falling out of everything. And the company management just looked at their bondholders and their equity holders and said, look, we're not going to take this $200 million that we had on, that they had borrowing capacity. No, actually, they borrowed over a billion dollars from their banks and they put it on their balance sheet and had the money there available to pay that debt instrument down but they decided that it was just a really bad use of that money. So they didn't make that payment. They looked at the bondholders and said, hey, um, we're going to have to restructure this debt. We're giving you the equity in this business. Um, there's $3 billion worth of debt. The debt right before they filed had gotten down to around 30, 40 cents on the dollar. And when they filed, we started buying debt at 20 cents on the dollar to 10 and 8 cents and 5 cents on the dollar. At five cents on the dollar on $3 billion worth of debt, you're paying $150 million. Am I getting that math right? It's a really low number. Yeah, it's $150 million. Um, for a business that was very, very similar to the business that was valued at $18 billion four years before that. 18 billion was too high. Okay, uh, 300 million was too low. Um, you know, who was gonna get the value? Probably those bondholders. There was one tranche of publicly traded debt that was almost all the debt outstanding except for the bank debt, and they had the cash to give the banks back their money. Um, they had a bank borrowing base of a couple of billion dollars. So the bank said that their assets, even last year, were worth $2 billion. Um, you know, we, we bottom ticked that one, and, and we were pretty good about that one, about not buying it on the way down. We bought most of our exposure really at the bottom. Um, but we were paying like, you know, orders of magnitude of hundreds of millions of dollars for assets that we're pretty sure. Look, we thought that debt was pretty much money good at $3 billion. Um, the stock here at 35 bucks a share is still trading a tiny fraction of, you know, the $10 billion we think the business is probably worth today. It, look, we think that business is worth today anywhere from $6 billion and up. 
And so we think we have more than a double in it from here. And we've already seen 4X our money on the investment. Definitely. And continuing on, uh, on the actual kind of energy train there, um, the, the, the viewers starting off here, uh, if correct, about a third of that portfolio is kind of landing in energy at the moment uh, based upon their calculations, and feel free to correct that. Uh, but can you frame the thought process used to select some of those current holdings? And um, I'll add on personally kind of this transition we're seeing towards EVs in the future, if you think that'll actually happen. So, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of energy exposure in the portfolio today, and that's for, and, and um, you know, part of the reason we have a big dollar amount of it and percentage energy exposure in the portfolio today is because of the way we bought it um, and how it's performed on the upside. Um, there was massive dislocation in that space a year ago, and we put capital to work into it, and hopefully we sharpened our pencil and did it in the right places. We did it in a really super diversified way, I think. Um, you know, whiting petroleum debt, um, which is the natural resource in the north, um, Oasis petroleum debt, which is the natural resource uh, in the south, um, Valeris offshore, which is the drilling rigs out there, Tidewater, which owns the supply vessels going back and forth, uh, OIS, we own a convertible bond, um, which is um, they own drilling rigs. The other huge investment winner for us this year, which I think is super exciting, is a company called Mammoth Energy. The symbol is T-U-S-K, Tusk. Um, it's been a big winner for us already. It's, stock is uh, up, uh, you know, we bought it initially at $1.20, $1.30 a share. We bought more at, $1, at, at $0.60 cents a share. There are roughly 45 million shares outstanding, if memory serves. Um, at a buck a share is $45 million equity cap. There's 60, $70 million worth of debt outstanding on the company. This is a company that started out um, as sort of a support company to Gulfport, which owns um, natural resources in the, in the Utica. And so um, Mammoth Energy um, has drilling rigs that are probably worth $100 million. They have fracking fleets. They've got um, like four of them or so that are probably worth 50 million ish dollars each. So they're probably worth a couple of hundred million dollars. They have huge amounts of uh, sand resource um, and they have some other miscellaneous um, supply stuff. We think you know that pool of oil service assets for Mammoth Energy are probably worth you know, 300 to $600 million, which considering the stock is, you know, at a couple of hundred million dollar market cap, that's pretty good. Um, but they are also owed about $250 million from Puerto Rico because they did about $2.83 billion worth of work restoring the electric grid in Puerto Rico. And there were a lot of machinations on how the contract was won um, and, and, and put in place. Um, there's been some sense that, uh, that there was, uh, improper relationships with people at, and with someone at, uh, Mammoth and, and FEMA. And when I say some indications, people are, <laughs> people are on trial. Um, but they probably, they did the work getting paid $250 million is a fair amount of money for them to have earned on $3 billion worth of revenues. No one is suggesting that they got that there are huge amounts of, of assets at Mammoth Energy that they milked from the government and now have, you know, 300, 700 million dollars of, of cash in the kitty. Mammoth has no extra money. All they have is being owed 300, 280 million dollars. Um, if they get paid that 200 plus million dollars, that's the stock price. And then you've got the energy assets. Um, so, you know, those are really different energy investments. There, there are probably eight of them in total. Um, they're definitely all energy and they all will go up and down with oil prices to a degree. Um, but I think even if oil prices aren't going up, I think we make QX uh, our current share price on, on our energy exposure. And look, you know, I think there was a huge dislocation. I think when those dislocations happen, you get opportunities and you put money to work. In terms of the long term, 
look, I hope electrification is the wave of the future. I hope carbon is not the wave of the future. I hope we don't have global warming. I hope we make more money on offshore wind than we do on, on oil over the next five and 10 years. Um, but I don't think all those changes are happening this year. Um, you know, there's still AM radio out there, I think. Um, so, you know, my point there is that carbon assets and, and oil and gas in the ground are going to be important for us for a long time. And, you know, I don't think 2021 is where we all stop using them. And I do hope that that our that our systems and, and our struct, you know, we get better at using alternative energy. And, uh, you know, and, and we don't warm up our planet till till the boiling point, because, you know, whatever your perspective on global warming, there's some amount happening and it sort of makes sense that burning a lot of oil makes the place warmer. Um, so I hope we do control it. But I don't think that means we go to zero, you know, two years from now. Absolutely. And we're going to go ahead and go out of order here uh, in our questions because uh, I'm hoping we can go ahead and crank this one out real quick, and then we'll end on this other one. Uh, first up, though, uh, are you still shorting uh, ENV after the late February decline? Uh, yes. Um, I think the – so that's Invesco, which we talked about real sh briefly in the middle of this presentation, so that email probably came up in the middle uh, before we talked about that. But, yeah, I think ENV is has got a long way down. <laughs> Um, you know, they came out with operating results in the last quarter that said, wow, we don't have real organic growth um, and we're going to probably have operating results down next year over last year. Um, but don't worry, that's only because we're investing for growth in the future. They don't have organic growth. Their business is really, really hard and really, really challenged. And by the way, um, you know, we know their systems, you know, we, we've seen them and they're not all great. Um, so yeah, we think they have a lot of challenges and the, op and the share price is just remarkably optimistic. You know, if you look at the UNFI stock chart on the way up and then on the way down, I think Invesco is waiting for the right-hand side of that stock chart and I think it's just starting to play out. Definitely. And getting to our last question here, um... A little bit more uh, speaking about guts than actual uh, jumping into the numbers here. When you watch a company go and you've purchased shares at twenty four fifty and they drop down to five dollars, how do you get the conviction to actually keep purchasing those shares? Well, first of all, I know stocks go to crazy places. You know, we've been doing this long enough, and we've all seen share prices go crazy and. Hey, look at that. We have company in the room. Um, we've all seen share prices go crazy. Um, hi, Lucy. Hi. Um, so we've all seen share prices go crazy on things we don't own. Um, just because we stepped in at 24, you know, doesn't mean it can't go to five. We've all seen crazy stock price action. So just because we're invested in it as it's happening doesn't make us think that we were wrong in the first place. And a lot of our biggest winners have been things that we bought on the way down and they get to crazy places. Now, you know, sometimes we bottom tick them. Sometimes we're disciplined enough to wait for that last little bottom and get in there and they jump higher. But a lot of times that doesn't happen. And that doesn't mean it's going to be a bad idea from the beginning. And you just have to go back and visit, revisit the numbers and ask yourself if the logic you looked at makes sense. And don't think the market's talking to you because, you know, that's not where you want to be in life. Definitely. Well, that'll round out our questions today. For everybody out there in the audience, uh, we do thank you for joining us today. It's, it's truly been a pleasure to have you all out here joining us and asking these questions. Uh, for anybody that missed anything or wants to get back into any of those slides uh, that we briefed over real quickly there, there will be a full recording of this presentation living here on our YouTube channel as well as on GuruFocus.com. Uh, do please go out there, subscribe to our channel if you do like this content. You'll get access to everything else that we're posting and stay up to date there. 
and do please like and comment on this video to help out with that YouTube algorithm. It'll really help us spread the, uh, the knowledge around and hopefully get some more views here in the future. Charles, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to answer these questions for our audience members. Thank you very much. All righty. And folks, that will wrap things up for us today. So we wish everyone a good one as they move on into their day.